Hey gang, uh, welcome to another uh, episode of Cool Folks Swinging by the First Light <laughs> Office. Or uh, we could say, welcome to the Rich Outdoors podcast. Yes, uh, so Cody Rich here, uh, Rich Outdoors podcast, uh, swung into Ketchum, Idaho today, and uh, we threw things up and decided to make, make this live event out of it. Uh, we're going to cover basically anything that you really want to cover. I uh, want to talk about uh, backcountry gear. Uh, backcountry setups. We yeah. Talk, we started talking about grizzlies because that conversation came up earlier, so we might talk about a little bit about grizzlies. Yes. And what else? Do some uh, gear giveaways. If you hang on till the end, we're going to do some gear giveaways. So, yes. Tune in. Yeah. And what are we going to do? Best, best question for a gear giveaway? Yeah, best question, uh, which I like to pass off on other people in the office so nobody <laughs> gets mad at me. So, we're going to determine what the best questions are after the fact, and we'll announce those winners uh, tomorrow. Uh, take your shades off, man. Oh. Uh, Cody's hat's really sweet, so if you want a rich outdoors uh, podcast, hat. podcast hat, we're gonna give one of those away too. Give one of those away. Give away some first light logo gear, and um, oh, you're getting comments on your Sturgill Simpson yeah. shirt. Oh, we're buffering. No, it's uh, does that mean we're buffering in real life? Well, I don't know. Black Rifle Coffee Company hat, or shirt, I think. So. Oh, okay. Nice. Um, so, uh, the big questions on grizzly bear encounters, or hunting in grizzly country. What? So, my question is, what's better, a gun or spray? Well, I think, unequivocally, the math says bear spray. Really? Yes. I don't know. I just don't feel comfortable in that situation. I th the biggest thing is you got to practice with everything, um, but you need to know how to get your bear spray handy, take the safety off, and pull the trigger. Yeah. And the beautiful thing about the bear spray is the aim, although important, is nowhere near as critical as. Yes. And if you think about, you know, you get in this mindset of like, if you're very, very savvy with a firearm, you're like, oh, I can hit anything. But if you look at it from a step back, you're trying to hit something across whatever distance with this little teeny tiny chunk of lead. Yeah, I feel really good about those odds. Hey, for the record, though, as someone who's been bluff charged or charged by a grizzly, I'm pretty sure you pulled a gun and not spray. That is true. <laughs> is that that is true. No, um, different situation, you know, um, I've been charged previous to, you know, the, the famous charge that was on TV, <laughs> um, which is a good, I mean, don't go into the woods with cameras would be the biggest takeaway I have from that. Cause just, if something crazy is going to happen, it's going to happen then. Uh, but you know, I... There was a lot of bear spray floating around prior to that. <laughs> I made a poor guide decision and thought that there was a lot of bear spray around and neglected to grab bear spray for myself. And, and I mean, I can't even remember at this point. It could have been even uh, worse. I could have had it, like, stuffed in my pack or something inaccessible. I can't remember right now, but... Um, yeah, so I had had a rifle in my hands and and uh, just did the best I could in that situation. Um, so when do you pull bear spray? Because like my instinct is to go for my pistol, like I, my hands down. And th and this is something that gets talked about in self defense classes. You go with the weapon that's most comfortable to you. And so in that case, like and having hunted in grizzly country, it's like if if I can pull both at the same time, that's kind of that's a win-win. <laughs> yes, yes. But I think naturally, like, I go for my gun. Do you think that's wrong? Um, I, what if you had a bear spray canister shaped like a gun? Well, okay, one of the things... In the exact same spot. <laughs> maybe, maybe. May it work. I feel like I need, like, a tack rail with a bear spray on it would be, like, the perfect situation. 
Yes. I have both at hand. Yeah. I would feel comfortable with that. Yeah. You know, it, it, there's such a brief amount of time, even for how large an animal it is. It seems like like you're going to have more time to react, but uh, I've been charged three times, uh, twice by so sows with cubs. Um, Ooh, that sounded good. We're going to put this in the frame because we always get this. All right, can you guys hear us better now? I think you're kind of a soft talker mm. also. My apologies. I'll speak louder. Yes. Um, so uh, once off uh, Marias Pass outside of Glacier National Park, um, densest population of grizzly bears in the uh, lower 48. Uh, I got charged by a sow with two cubs. First, it was her first, uh, she was a first time mom. And I had no interest in, she was making some mistakes, some assumptions. I had no interest in, in harming that bear. And so I wanted to do the best I could to not harm that bear and keep myself and my dog safe at the time. And uh, all I had on me was a pistol and I never even pulled the pistol. Hmm. Uh, and honestly, like, posture and staying calm, I think, is kind of what saved the day in that particular instance. But that was the closest a grizzly bear has ever come to me. And, uh, and that bear charged three times and hit the brakes every time, obviously. Um, so just bluff charges. Right, right. Otherwise, you wouldn't have the good-looking individual you see before you right so now. So someone mentioned that, you know, keeping bear spray accessible. Um, definitely, I think that's one of the things that a lot of people don't do well. And, you know, if you're going to have bear spray, things are going to happen quickly. So make sure it's, like, on your waistband or on your belt. The other thing that I did, I caught myself doing uh, last year in Montana, was that I had because my waistband on my pack was wrapped around my waist obviously it's kind of hard to have it on your belt but there's a lot of times you would drop your pack and not even think about it and so then I'd leave my bear spray with my pack um, so definitely if you can find a way to to mount it to your your belt and not your pack I think that's a lot better as well yeah I uh, I absolutely agree um, I think as you're like developing your experiences out there in the woods you go through this whole list of things where you're like oh it'd be very efficient to clip that here or clip this here and then the second you set that pack down it's inaccessible so greg tubbs writes you know when being charged what's your first reaction mine is holy crap um <laughs> well i mean what's yours yeah the idea is to, like to stand your ground right so i mean as hard as it is you the want, best thing you can do is stand your ground. The, I think the the truest thing that comes through is animals are looking for more calories, not less. So if you can slow the situation down and they have to think, like, is this going to be worth the effort? I think that is ultimately what, uh, you know, stays off. A, an encounter versus a really bad encounter. <laughs> um, so you make that animal think, is this, this thing didn't run away, so they're already sizing up the situation. Um, is it going to be worth it for me to tussle with this individual? I'm going to move it so you can see us better. Yeah, working on our framing. We're not photographers. No, no. <laughs> All right, what other questions we got? Um, tons of uh, So I, I guess let's stick on... Let's stick uh, on gear questions. Yeah? I just did a gear episode, and I got a ton of questions. Actually, comically, the one question I got repeatedly the other day was, what socks do I wear? Oh, yeah. What socks do you wear? I wear the same sock whether it's 90 degrees or 110 degrees. Uh, well, boot fit degrees. is <laughs> the prime prime deal. So, how many pairs of socks do you take in the backcountry? Say you're going on a hunt 10 days. How many socks do you take? 
depending on two to three pairs max. We're going the wrong way. Oh, oh, we're maybe. Going the way. How many so, pairs yes. of socks do you bring? Two to three pairs max. I change them every day. No, I don't. I I'll pick two pairs and I'll hold on and not change my socks as long as I can. There's nothing better than putting on brand new socks. And like I'll even save a brand new pair for like day seven or day eight. Because there's nothing better than being miserable and having a brand new pair of socks. Yes, and for me, that's the third pair of socks, right? <laughs> that's so, what say. Yes, so uh, two pairs of socks, alternate them every day if you can. If they're soaked, you know, I'll jam a pair in my pockets or um, do you just sleep, wear them. Do you sleep in socks or out of socks? I do not like sleeping in socks. <laughs> but if they're wet, that's, that's all you can do. Um, yeah, so alternate them every day. And then you have that third pair for when you're like, boy, this is really miserable. Yeah. Put on a brand new pair of socks, and it is a brand new day. Yeah. Nothing like new socks. Um, I will take a – like, if it's going to have potential to get real cold, I'll take a big pair, like a pair of just thickies, mm -hmm. just in case everything goes awry. I've had so many issues with my feet. Uh I'm not like a blister prone person, but I just got to this point where I was getting actual nerve damage in my feet. And so I went I went to like this boot guru here in town, um, Brett Hansen Orthotics. And he, you know, put me through some misery, custom footbeds, trying to reestablish my arch, all this stuff. But his big thing is lots of space in the toes. So you have room to move your toes, and uh, you want your ankle locked down so you're not actually getting foot slippage, and stick with the same sock. Like, because the critical part is the fit of your boot. Yeah. And, man, it's it's been the best thing I've done. Yeah. Um, I know, like, every time that I've had issues, it's because you put on too, too many socks or too big a socks, so you put on an extra pair of socks. You can't move your toes that much, and then that's why you get the cold feet. Yeah, and I've had real issues with expanding my boot too much. Um, all of a sudden, that boot's sloppy all the time, and and, and that's that's a bad deal, uh, particularly when all of a sudden you're throwing on wait, big, wait, wait. heavy loads. There's a mustache you a question here. Any difference between the Red Deserts and the new Underoos? Underoos? What's the Underoos? Oh, uh, the short... Short boxers, yeah. Okay, first off, this is my favorite First Light product. <laughs> Hands yes. down, is the uh, the Red Deserts. I always say uh, I talk with with many many folks much tougher than I am about their underwear, because uh, <laughs> it uh, yeah a lot, a lot of tough guys wearing merino wool boxers, but what's the uh, benefit of merino wool boxers? Man, they just don't stink. It does not matter what you do what job you have you're you're just going to feel better and you're <laughs> going to comfortable yeah the biggest complaint that we get is from guys wives and girlfriends are like yeah he's been wearing the same boxers for seven <laughs> days uh, but that's the benefit of it yeah it, and man i be totally honest it is crazy fifty dollars for a pair of boxers sixty in camo crazy but Are it camo makes boxers important a though? huge huge difference does camo boxers make a difference it is <laughs> we we sell out faster than solids if i do not know why really it may be like the new zealanders who aren't aren't afraid to Just do some hunting that. in their short shorts yeah, yeah. i yeah. hunt in my short shorts though the da here's the problem i don't know if i can say this on facebook live at first light but yeah, the can. problem with first light boxers is when you get out there in the woods and you gotta you gotta go number two. And yep. you don't have any toilet paper, you know, usually you used to take a square out of your underwear. I can't do that with a fifty pair fifty dollar pair of boxers. No, you cannot. <laughs> don't do it. No. So, you know, like that's that's the problem is all my gear's so fancy now I can't Yeah, I gotta tell you that was never that was never my go to. Never really? cut it. Yeah. I'm where, not a big clothes you, guy. Obviously I wear the Leafs? same T shirt all the time. Leafs? Are you a Leafs? Yeah, detritus, whatever, whatever <laughs> out there, yeah, for sure. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, the boxers are worth doing. Um, they are, if you're in a job where you have to do, like, lots of plane travel, lots of 
sitting in a truck driving. It'll it will change your change your world around. Okay, I got a question for you. Um, says in regards to ventilation outweighs stability and comfort in a boot. So is most or most really well built boots are not ventilated well. So ventilation in a boot. Yeah. Thin or thick? I I go with. I'm I'm a big fan of the all leather boot. Much more upkeep, but I feel like they breathe better than something with a liner. Um, the problem is with a liner boot, in my experience, and, and boots are one of these tricky subjects. Like, I hate recommending boots to people. I typically go with, like, well, this is what I have tried. Are you tried. a bigger boot or are you a smaller boot person? Bigger boot. Bigger boot? Yep. Yep. Um, you run the same boot throughout every season? Since I've gotten like my foot beds, which take up volume, so I have basically like a long, super low volume foot. I always call it like a lady's foot, but um, <laughs> it is a long foot that takes up very little space. And uh, I crush all my boots from the sides and from the top down. Mm. And they exp there's ultimately just way too much volume in there. And um, I got these orthotics. They take up volume. Which they keep my that? foot. Uh, I just I said that uh, this dude in town oh, from Ski one. Tech uh, here in Ketchum, Idaho. Um, crazy expensive. Best purchase I've ever made. So really, do you think that that's worth it? This is the first season since I was probably 17 that I've been able to wear the same pair of boots two years in a row. Wow, that's pretty good. Yeah, and we're talking. You know, two hundred and fifty to five hundred dollar boots. Do you run insulated or non insulated boots? Non insulated, no liner. Uh because I feel like, you know, your Gore Tex liners, your event, uh, whatever you have, you know, what's gonna kill those things is abrasion and uh dirt. And man, dirt gets into those liners and they fail and there's nothing you can do at that point. So uh, leather, all leather boot, it breathes. <laughs> the problem is you gotta take care of them, right? You gotta clean them, I have like this tidy little boot kit, a couple of brushes. I actually have like a, a shower tile grout brush that I find that has a little pick on the end of it, real stiff bristles, and then like a big comb brush. Brush everything down, get all the dirt off of it, take a big wet towel, clean it up, and then leave the towel on my leather boots and they absorb the moisture and then I pull that off and then I grease the shit out of them. Super grease them and then let them sit and absorb and then uh, just kind of wipe that excess grease off and then um, that is the thing that has worked the best for me. Matthew Brown asks, what do you use to waterproof your boots? Or can waterproof and condition your boots? Uh, man, what, we got a bunch of this uh, stuff from uh, Baker Shoes in Baker, Oregon. Um, and those things, that, that stuff's been great for me. So um, I'm sure I've tried some other things uh, around that, but, you know, uh, White's boots have been like the all leather, leather working man's boot forever. And they have some specifications for keeping that leather in shape. And so I'd say when in doubt, check that, check that out. Uh, are you an uh, insulated boot, non-insulated boot? Non-insulated, always leather, and uh, my go-to for um, seal, I always use just snow, snow seal yep. from Bimart. I love that stuff. I don't know, it's worked good for years. Yeah. I'm, what about I'm, the Gore-Tex liner? You... I, I don't like the Gore-Tex liners, but I will say one of my secret weapons is Gore-Tex socks. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, inevitably you're going to soak through and you're going to have wet boots, and then there's... Like the Gore-Tex socks is just, I don't mind putting on wet boots every day, soaking wet, frozen, whatever. Got Gore-Tex socks. It's my yes, uh, Gore-Tex socks. I have not thought about them in quite a while. <laughs> but uh, Not a lot of people use them, though. They saved my butt on the Alaska Peninsula one time. I had my right foot, my right boot, the liner failed, and was just miserably soaked the entire time. And I had a Gore-Tex sock. And it made made life much more enjoyable for 21 days. Yeah, so. I mean, last year we were in Montana, and I mean, it rained for three, four or five days straight. And inevitably, you can't keep your stuff dry when you're hunting that long. And 
it just soaks through eventually. And the, the problem is, is once you get your boots super waterproof, is they're, they're also stay wet for a long time. Um, and so yes. having Gore-Tex socks, my boots are literally frozen solid every day I put them on, and it was just Gore-Tex socks. That's saved my bacon a lot of time. Uh, do you have tips for bear avoidance? Um, don't hunt in bear country, but I <laughs> that's a great tip. Um, I, you know, I'd say one of the tips, you know, it's pretty common sense, but don't sit and call in the same spot for too long. Um, these are great tips that I should probably write down and learn myself because, I mean, just last year we were talking about how I was calling, just bugling in the same spot too long and had a nice grizz come see what it was all about. So, yeah. you know, I think that's probably one of the biggest mistakes. I mean, if you're going to hunt in bear country, don't stick around in the same spot too long. And it gets tough because, I mean, you're calling for elk and you, you hear something pop, you never know whether it's an elk or a bear. And so, I mean, there was probably multiple times last year where I'm walking with a bow in one hand and a rifle in the other, or a pistol in the other. Like, I don't know what's coming in, but something's coming in. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Things that go uh, pop in the night for sure. <laughs> um, you know, there is the basic stuff. Uh, Ooh, that's a good question. Keep what? a clean camp. If you don't think it affects bears, it absolutely affects bugs in camp. You don't want bugs in camp crawling all over everything. You can have a 10 gajillion ants in camp. Um, keep a really clean camp. Doesn't doesn't cost any extra time. Um, another good bear avoidance thing is, I, I mean, you really should hang your food. Again, if you don't think it's that effective on bears. Um, what about electric fences? Electric fences have pretty much been proven to work, so I've never used them, but <laughs> yes. So I got a good question that was up in there. I missed the name, sorry, but um, one said, what's the oldest piece of gear in your pack? Ooh, I like that one. Uh, my dad got me a Ruana knife when I was ooh, 17, 16, 17, a uh, knife maker out of Missoula, Montana, or Bonner, Montana. And uh, this is, uh, I mean, it's its a sweet old bone handled knife and I only take it on grizzly bear hunts now because I've skinned a couple of grizzlies with it and, uh, and it's just like, it's too valuable to take out every time, but I take it on, on grizzly bear hunts, uh, hoping, hoping to uh, keep that tradition alive. And that, that is the oldest chunk of gear depending on what rifle I'm packing around. I had to think about it. I don't, I don't know if I have any old gear right now. I don't have any, like, sentimental old stuff anyway. I'm really good at losing gear, so I don't think I get to keep it that long. Me too. I have an extra, I have a spare Leatherman that has been lent out many times, but it is the Leatherman tool that will not die because what you do is lose them. Nothing else happens to them. Uh, if they get loose, you can tighten them up. If they get rusty, you can, you know, coat them down and, and get the rust off. You lose them. And for some reason, I've had this Leatherman tool since high school. And, uh, yeah, that, that one will not die. So someone asked, it's pouring rain and cold. What's the one piece of gear that comes to mind that you can't live without? And this, like, for me, the rain gear is definitely the, the top one. And that's every hunt. Um, I mean... That's kind of a no-brainer, but what's yours? Is it a shelter or a rain gear? Because I, I, I well, have this you, argument. You a lot took, of guys will pack shelter, but I would just soon have rain gear and just. If you take that angle, I'll, I'll say uh, a jet boil or a stove Ooh. in that situation. Yeah, some hot coffee. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hot, I mean, hot coffee can change the mood of everybody. Uh, I, I'm also a fan of. Uh, uh, I don't do a lot of drink powder and stuff, but Wilderness Athlete has this uh, hydrate and recover, and that makes a nice little tea. Oh, I'd yeah. cut it down. It's probably 70% <laughs> water, but yeah, that's nice. Nice little pick-me-up. So what's the cheapest item in your pack that you can't live without? Oh, boy. The cheapest item in my pack. I'll give you some time to buy, or yeah, buy some time because I'm going to say like a Snickers bar. Ooh, I don't pack yeah. a lot of them, but like if I get a Snickers bar 
and I like I'll I'll even save them until it's really bad. So I'm like starving, miserable, and I'm like, man, I got chocolate in my bag. A hundred and ten percent, the thing that will make me the most angry is when I leave my long spoon, <laughs> and they are dirt cheap. Uh, but when I lose that or leave it, it somewhere or like I, it just melts me down. Yes. I will say I used to run just an MRE big spoon. Yes. And because it's lighter than a, you know. And they're super deep. Yeah, and they're yeah. awesome. But I snapped one. Well, actually, last year I snapped it and I had a electrical tape, a stick from the spoon part to the handle part. So my entire spoon last year was like duct Character. Tape together. Yeah, <laughs> custom, custom. Okay, so we we tackled. Um, what is the oldest piece of gear that you have? Do you have a piece of gear that you take every year, but you have to replace every year? Not a heritage piece, but a replaceable piece. Um, where are you going with that? Because like, i got to replace some gear. Like, is there something that you're like, ah, I can't believe I'm buying this again? Okay, so here's a funny story. Um, headlights, for some reason. Yep. I have this innate ability to lose headlights like no other. But then they'll all turn up at the same time. I don't know how it's possible. Like it's it's a purely a magic trick because yes. literally you lose them, buy them, lose them, buy them, lose them, buy them, and all of a sudden you're like, I have six headlights today. Like where where did this come from? Yes. So I I am if somebody has like the best headlamp out there, please let me know because I felt like I had two that were the best on the planet. Do you you take quality or quantity on headlamps? Like I would. Like I just I think a cheap headlamp to me is fine. Oh, I am a one headlamp guy. That is it. Do you lose them? No. Oh. No. See, I lose them, so I don't invest much in that. No, product. like at the trailhead, headlamp goes in my pocket. It never comes out. Cool. Side pocket because I I mean I loathe taking my pack off <laughs> for any reason. Sure. So there's a couple of things that I know I'll be digging into the pack for. Headlamps, one of them. So, but I am currently on. I'm I'm having a hard time on the headlamp side of things. So it says, have you ever tried? We'll, we'll get off on tangent here. Have you ever tried mixing instant potatoes or top ramen with your mountain house? Um, so, I like the instant potatoes because it's added calories. Like I'm a fat kid, so mountain house is not quite enough. So I I always I don't mix them in. But I'll eat my mountain house and then use the bag to cook the mount or the potatoes in. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like if like it's it. the right mountain house, you could probably get away with putting potatoes in there. Do you ever use those potatoes or top ramen? I do not eat as much anymore for I have no idea what reason. Uh, <laughs> but what's your go-to meal in the backcountry? I used to put at least half a package of top ramen in every single mountain house. Really? Yes. Didn't yeah. matter what flavor or whatever. But um, many times I ate an entire package of Top Ramen. But um, what was the go-to question? Uh, something about do you ever put Top Ramen or uh, uh, potatoes in your... What is your go-to mountain house flavor? Or dehydrated mm -hmm. food flavor? You know, I used to be a Chili Mac guy for a long time. Like mm -hmm. That is hardcore mm -hmm. Chili Understandable. Mac. I don't know that the um, chicken teriyaki is pretty good. I will say the chicken teriyaki, if you got some fresh grouse to put in it, is the best. Chicken teriyaki was like the first mountain house flavor, I, I feel. Um, I haven't I haven't gone back <laughs> since. <laughs> just, just chicken teriyaki. Yeah, that That's was it. a long, long time ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, so often I'm like, just give me hot food, I don't care. Yeah. So, uh, but there, I, I'm not one of those people that dislikes them. Like I can eat many, many mountain house, and do you ever make your own mountain houses or I don't. No, I want to try that this no. year. Actually. I do too, but it's daunting. It's yeah. And I have so many projects that I don't. Yeah. Beef yeah. stroganoff. That's a good one. Matthew Brown says beef stroganoff. Ah, uh, spaghetti's pretty up there too. Like I don't know. Yeah, lasagna. Uh, Super good. good. The problem with lasagna is it screws up your spoon for the rest of the trip. It does. So like, the you cannot get the cheese off You can't there. get that off there. Um, sweet and sour pork. That's an, I think they discontinued that one, but that was a really nice change up. Had like this uh, pineapple in there. Really, it was good. 
Um, <laughs> Everyone just call me. I love it. I bring, like, I love canned fish. So sardines, octopus, uh, tuna, uh, smoked oysters, smoked clams, any of that stuff. And I bust them out about the time where anybody in camp will drink every ounce of the leftover liquid. And, uh, oh boy, the, about the only bad experience I've had with that, we uh, were working on a bear survey in Montana. Um, and we were experimenting with these Indian food uh packs of food and I had a tin of sardines and we did this monster mega hike and big storm and everything and mixed the sardines in with the Indian food that was that was a test of your metal <laughs> have you someone said that Heather's Choice is good I haven't tried Heather's Choice yet but I've heard good things about it it's I like a alternative to Mount Mouse love the breakfasts and the pack roots recommend those two oh and I, I do feel like there's enough fat in those that you don't have to bring as much food. That's definitely a person-to-person -person type of thing. But, yeah, you can reduce your food weight. Like, there's something in those that are pretty impressive. So Matthew writes, do you usually carry uh, something to catch fish with, you know, supplement your food? Um, it depends on where you're at. But if, if the option is there, definitely. I mean, when I hunted in Alaska, I was like, I literally took about half as much food as I needed because I just based, based that on I'm going to catch enough fish, which is kind of a, a gamble. Yeah, that's impressive. <laughs> that's impressive. I I really don't. I feel like if I'm really like giving it my all to the pursuit that I end up just not having that leisure time. It's true. Because yeah. very, very quickly – these little side gambles and side ventures can turn into major adventures and major gambles. That's true. And man, once you get hungry and you start looking at how little food you have left, all of a sudden that is your full time pursuit. So, what's your thought on hunting hungry? Because Remy likes to, Remy Warren likes to go in and not take enough food. Yes. He's hungry. What's your thought on that? Hungry hunter hunts best. Um, Hangry hunter doesn't know how to focus. <laughs> Yeah, that, I mean, that would That's be my thought, <laughs> for sure. For sure. I'm not a real, like, snacker, um, so I don't bring a ton of stuff, but uh, I'll definitely have enough and then a little bit of in reserve. Uh, Diamond Mo Fallon. Oh, I'll make her to L.A., buddy. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, the... Uh, uh, this this fellow that just commented, Morgan Fallon, uh, he and I uh, were in Big Timber, Montana for over a week when uh, it the static temperature, no windage included, was 17 below zero. Uh, that that was a that'll test your metal right there. Uh, I saw a good one on trekking poles. Oh, this is a new one for me. So I was I was anti trekking poles until last year, and I actually tried them and. They're pretty amazing. I'm not gonna lie. Yes. Like I, I don't know. I was kind of against them, but they definitely, definitely work. Like four wheel drive. Yeah. That, I mean, that's a very sim simple, perfect way to put it. It extra stability on off kilter terrain, which is what we're in all the time out here. Um, saves your knees. Supposed to take, I think, 10% off off the load on your knees. And uh, for me, you know, it's a quick way to rest my binoculars to get you know a bipod style binocular rest um, it's a great way uh, if you cross your trekking poles it's a great way to uh, you know steady your rifle something I would definitely practice and not just assume but yes trekking poles uh, something lightweight that breaks down like the three piece breakdown I have a set of black diamonds right now that are killer um, and yes, I mean, you don't have to have them both in your hands. You don't have to have one in your hand, but when you need them, they're fantastic. Agreed. So let's talk about your real secret weapon. 
I guess it's kind of both of our secret weapon when it comes to hunting. Your mustache. Oh, yeah. Does it make you a better hunter? No. No, it does not. I used to, uh, you know, I get in this habit of going where, like this. Where did you get, where did your mustache come from? I cannot grow a beard. So you just sat in a mustache was it? Yeah, ever since I was a little kid, I wanted like a mountain man beard. But I cannot <laughs> grow one, so I grew a mustache because apparently I can do that. <laughs> Mine's similar. Well, mine, I had a beard, I had a full beard, and I think it was two, three years ago, as a joke, decided I would shave it all off for a Super Bowl party. Well, I was going to shave it off anyway because it just got too long. And then for the Super Bowl party, I decided I'd just have a mustache because that would be funny. But I really like my mustache. And it is funny. <laughs> it's still funny. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. a conversation starter. But I think it does make you a better hunter. Yeah? yeah. Why is that? Windage? Uh, yeah, just check the wind. You know? Yes. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I got in this, like, nervous habit of going like this for a while. Yeah, I play with mine. And uh, I used to use... Um, the uh, cow in heat estrus gel you put all the time. Uh, well, I <laughs> was like, oh yeah, this would work, you know. And so I was like rubbing it on, you know, tree branches, and I was like, oh, I'll rub it into my boots, like into the leather on my boots, and, and I'd have that stuff on me all the time. And then I'd do this like nervous twitch, oh. and I just rub That's terrible cow in heat estrus gel in my mustache <laughs> and then every time the wind would change you smelled elk I'd be like oh you guys smell them <laughs> there's elk here so that would that would be a negative I feel yeah it really it hinders your scent it does aspect in the hunting field yeah. it does <laughs> uh, floored or floorless shelters I have been floorless for I think without exception for four years, and I have nothing negative to say. Really? Yeah. What was the biggest hurdle for you to go floorless shelters? You know, the biggest question mark I had was water. I'm like, oh man, is there going to be a bunch of water coming oh, in the man. floor of the tent? Um, the only negative I've had was I had some poor placement. Um, my big yellow lab and I were camped out on the side of a mountain uh, night before opening day and I put this shelter, you know, everything is just so steep around here on uh, in an elk bed and inside the elk bed was a big ant hill. So, but there was no other place mm -hmm. to sleep that night. So that Did was you pretty miserable. Did you go to or what style do you run? Yeah, I mean, they're all kind of variations of teep. Yeah, I mean, like lean-to, teepee-style stuff. Yeah. But I'd recommend all of them. And all this stuff just you takes... You can have one tent. If you can only use one tent, what would it be? You don't have the luxury of having everyone. Like, what's the your one tent that you'd have that could work for every hunt? Goo. I mean, that is that is very tough. I would say for just for myself, and this was like year-round forever in perpetuity um, I would say a long rain fly like a 14 foot rain fly ultralight to where I could drop one end and make a wind shelter light a fire in there work with the wind something like that because that would really wouldn't be ideal for a lot of situations but it'd be better than having like a full blown Wall tent, yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's. I mean, I do a lot of hunting in a full blown wall tent, so I've kind of been kicking around the idea of going with something that's lighter weight, um, just to save on everything, just easier. Yes. Um, I mean, like we pulled that sixteen person teepee out today. I'm like, man, that thing's so tiny compared to a wall tent. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just a even a eight man wall tent, half the size. Um, that's way tiny, light, easy. Makes it makes everything easier. Yes. So that's kind of the benefit I see. Well, so, uh, yeah, the guys that I'd uh, go into the Bob Marshall Wilderness in Montana with, um, you know, we had stock, but not a ton of stock. And if somebody shot a bull, at least one person was taking two to three animals out. So that reduced the amount of stock that we had. And eventually it was like, well, why don't we switch over to this backpacking gear? take ultralight uh, tents 
uh, collapsible stoves, all this, we could basically take the entire camp that we had, put it on one mule, yeah. versus, you know, at least three mules, and then that stock was available for the important stuff, which was getting elk meat out of the woods, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now, that is met with, there's a lot of tradition involved in any sort of hunting, and that was definitely met with, with some blowback, like, where's my big fat steak and my potato? Yeah, and, that's interesting, like, as soon as you get into, like, the horsebacking world, like, a lot of the guys that are into horsebacking, hunting off horses and things like that, it instantly gets into, like, this tradition of you have to have a wall tent, you have to be eating steaks every night. Like, yeah, and, like, and I have steak. to have a giant cooler full of ice for cocktails. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's like it's interesting to to meld. I mean, we've already melded the two worlds of lightweight backpacking and kind of hunters, and now our melt it just keeps going farther. And so it's like, oh, as we go backcountry packing, the stuff is so good and you can be so comfortable that uh, you know the cot issue inside big tents is is uh, kind of a double edged sword. Like, yeah, it takes up more space, but then you can you have a bunch of storage space. Mm-hmm underneath your cot um, as opposed to just going with straight ground pads. Do you take cot or ground pads? Uh, when we're with stock, I think it's worthwhile having a cot, but I think more for the storage issue. It's not for yeah. comfort for me. Yeah. I mean, the cots are nice. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. A cot is more comfortable than sleeping on the ground, but push comes to shove, I'm still going to sleep on the ground if I have to, right? Yes. It doesn't make a difference, really. Do you like uh, cover scents? I don't know. I go back and forth. So if I hunt in the backcountry, it's kind of like uh, if I'm if I'm hunting out of the truck, I don't think there's any. It's not hurting anything, so I might as well, mm-hmm. right? So I might as well take that small extra step. But when it comes to going in the backcountry, I usually don't take it with me because I feel like it's kind of not necessary. What's yeah. your thought? I think it is so hard to like really play that game perfectly. Like, there's always going to be some sort of contaminant, if you will. Yeah. Like, there's always going to be something that's going to be messing up that scent-free game. Mm-hmm. That, I, man, for me, it is... I haven't touched yeah, but if anything it you, in 10 years. If it bought you 10 extra seconds, you know what I mean? Like Yeah, and that is all you need. That is more than you need in a lot yeah. of situations. Yeah. And that's, my only thought is, like, yeah, I, didn't, I haven't showered in five days, so it probably doesn't make a bit of difference. But if I yeah. hose down with some dead down wind and it buys me 10 extra seconds when the wind swirls at that right moment, that right time, then maybe it's worth it. Yeah. I mean, but I mean, that's also like the, uh, the sugar pill analogy, right? Maybe that's just you. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. It's true. I do not know. I, I, I do know, like, I mean, that's the same analogy that I use for camo all the time. Yeah. I, I feel like, you know, you can be dead still in so many situations have animals walk right up to you but in order to be you know uh, not just a nature observer you are going to have to move and you know a good camouflage pattern allows you to get away with a certain amount of movement and that is truly the definition for me of what works and what doesn't work you know the the thing with camo though is that if I'm going to buy gear, say I'm going to go buy a new pair of pants I'm going to hunt in. Obviously, I'm, I'm a big wool fan, so I'm going to go buy merino wool. If I'm going to buy pants, I might as well take that extra little bit and buy camo. Like, I don't know if it makes a difference or not. Probably not. But again, if it buys me that one time that something doesn't yes. see me or that, you know, maybe I was standing in the sun in the wrong spot, um, then it's worth it because I was going to buy that gear anyway. Or you're in a really uncomfortable position and you just can't stand there forever. Yeah. 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 So I think it, it does, it just going that extra little bit, a mind's well. Do I think it's absolutely necessary? No. I could probably hunt in flannel and blue jeans, the same. Yeah, but I, yeah, I mean, I, like I said, there's, it, uh, I don't really think we're reinventing the wheel here, but the, that is where the difference lies for me. It's like, there's many forms of hunting if you want to get up close and personal and be able to swing your bow, shotgun, rifle. I feel like that is the situation where camouflage makes a difference. What about sleeping bags? 
Jason Stewart asks, is sleeping bags, you know, what's better, which one should he buy, what temperature, all that good stuff. Yeah, I, I do think uh, it is better to go uh, heavier versus lighter um, in, in pretty much everything. But sleeping bags, yeah, I think if you think it's going to be 20 degrees, buy a zero degree bag. Um, I sleep hot and I don't like being hot. Um, so I have two sleeping bags that have almost never been zipped all the way up because I just open them wide up and lay them over the top of me like a quilt. And um, right now I run a 20 degree bag and that's the same way. Like I wear it as a quilt. I have a good thick uh, sleeping pad, like the high R value sleeping pad. I think that is something you should probably invest more in than the sleeping bag, in, in my opinion. Um, so what sleeping pad do you run? I have, man, it's a down X-Ped, X-Ped down mat. And I, man, I, I've easily had that thing for seven years. Wow pretty good yes i know in that time i burned through at least two of them so i had the cabela's uh xpg whatever the x okay whatever cabela's things is um that one kind of got some bubbles in it and then um currently in the thermo rest one yeah good pad i mean uh, i used to run the z rest just closed cell foam you know eggshell closed cell foam z rest for ever and then uh i had a couple of situations where i switched over to this heavier like I thought obnoxiously heavy sleeping pad at the time, but here's a good question: Do you great. run any tick or bug repellent? You know, I carry a small thing of hundred percent DEET with me. Gets used not all that often, even in BC. Yeah, I I never run anything, which is probably why I've had multiple ticks, <laughs> but. Um, I think if I was, you know, in a in tick infested area, it'd probably be a good good idea to run something. But yes. permethrin is the thing that I hear the most as like the end all be all. That's something that you put on your clothing, not on you. But um, yeah, if you're in a really ticky area, you know, like we don't have crazy Lyme disease out here, um, like a lot of the eastern states do. Um, yeah, those little tiny bugs that you can't really see. Yeah, I'd get permethrin. So Jack Gibson, this might be a contender for best question of the night, but if you could hunt with anyone from the past, who would it be? I, I mean, he's not from the past. I'd just say Bill Murray because <laughs> I just want to do anything with Bill Murray. So. Come on, Teddy? Bill I, Murray or Teddy? I think we would get, I don't know, I think Bill Murray would be like more receptive to just relaxing and having fun. Maybe we should do a group hunt with Bill Murray and Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how that would go. I mean, obviously there's a lot of, you could learn from a lot of these guys, but like you read about Hemingway and uh, Roosevelt and Jack O'Connor, and there's a lot of things that come out where I'm like, yeah, I probably wouldn't see eye to eye with them on a lot of things. That's probably true. That's probably true. Bill Murray is definitely going to be a good time. I don't think it'd be a backcountry hunt, though. Yeah, you'd be great in camp. Like, <laughs> I mean, if we're living in the land of make-believe, right? Like, we have a great time. I still think Teddy Roosevelt. Like, if you could say you want hunting with Teddy Roosevelt, that's pretty, pretty. Oh awesome. yes, very <laughs> awesome. You're very awesome. Uh, uh, what was the? Good Do you one? carry a sidearm in the in the backcountry? Uh, I used to carry a sidearm. I, I. You don't carry one anymore. I really don't. Like, unless. Unless we're working with stock in like really difficult situations, where there could be an op, you know, the necessity to put something down. I am 100%. I have a sidearm all the time, any hunt, every hunt. I just yeah. it's my comfort zone. Like I have no problem going into anywhere. I just feel more comfortable. To me, it's just like you sleep easier. I just no worries. Yeah. I don't know. To me, it's a safety thing. It's like my security blanket. This is a good controversial one. Uh, Idaho Fish and Game is considering allowing baiting for wolves. What are uh, your thoughts on baiting for wolves? 100%. And I agree. Same with baiting for bears. I think certain areas require it. I think 
um, as we move forward with the wolf population and the issues, it's proving a little bit difficult to just shoot them spot and stop. Um, they've kind of they're, they're a smart animal, and so I think in order to manage numbers, that's purely it. I think that we should allow baiting in certain areas. I mean, obviously, it's it's all about quota. Everything boils down to how many animals are we taking out of the herd. Yep. Whether it's wolves, whether it's elk, and it's like okay, when it comes to wolves, if we're not meeting those numbers and objectives, then it's either allow hunters to bait them, or we pay the government to shoot them out of helicopters. So why not have hunters? I, I absolutely agree on this. So the thing that I would like to remind people is the reason seasons get longer or the reason they discuss allowing baiting or something that makes it seem easier is because hunters are doing a really bad job of taking out the amount of animals that the biologists say need to be removed from the population. In theory. In theory, yes. <laughs> There's a lot of politics involved. There's right? some politics involved <laughs> too. But, you know, in my short time here in Idaho, um, I've certainly seen it firsthand. Uh, you know, hunters can get a bad rap on some of this stuff, but, man, the Livestock Growers Association in the state, when they have to pay for helicopters flying around to shoot these things, they get a really bad rap. So all the, you know, everybody's paying for it. Um, I, th I, th I I would, I don't disagree with allowing uh, baiting for wolves. Here's a great question. Someone says, what's the best single tip for a new hunter? There's so much, I'm curious, what's the one thing someone would suggest? Oh. I mean, this is a good tip for every single hunter. I think you need to know what success is. And I say this all the time, but if for me success was carrying out something dead, I, I mean, I would have so little con success compared to the amount of effort I've put in. Like, I would I would be the biggest loser on the planet. Uh, I, yeah, I think I think you just need to know that this is an education game, and you're constantly going to be learning. And the learning part is is what is ultimately the most fulfilling. Um, so you know, adjust your expectations, know what they are. Yeah, and I think I mean that's 100% accurate. And I think that so many people go into it like success is only if I kill something, um, and that's where people get discouraged and then they give up. I would say if, if you're going to go that route, I'll, I'll take a different route, and I'll just say that. Just assume that everything's going to be twice as hard as you think, and you have to work twice as hard and for twice as long. Um, I think a lot of people underestimate how long it takes. Say, say you want to go on an elk hunt. You're going to go on your first elk hunt, and especially if your prior experience is weekend and evening hunting. A lot of people that whitetail hunt, you know, they don't spend a full week hunting and chasing things, and so they they evening hunt and weekend hunt. So when they come on their first elk hunt, it's very it's a big change and it's, it's a lot of work and so you get into day three or four and you get down um, everything can change in an instant and I think that's so important to just keep a positive mindset and just keep hammering away day after day and keep telling yourself hey it could change in an instant it could change five minutes from now and elk could run out and I could shoot it and that would be it it would be awesome it'd be amazing um, it can happen so fast out there that you can't get down on yourself fear of failure will ruin a trip, it will ruin your experience, it will ruin your attitude. And and I see it so often. Ooh. Like it's like, oh I gotta shoot this thing because I can't go home empty handed. And then it's like, oh well you get these comments like, well it's not the biggest buck on the mountain, but it's no slouch either. <laughs> it's like, come on. Thanks. <laughs> be, Thanks. Be happy. And, and don't don't be afraid to uh, go home em empty-handed. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, trophy pictures? Ooh, that's a good question. That is a good question. So... Age of social media. The age of social media. You know, I, I remember 15 years ago when it first kind of dawned on me. I remember reading an article that was talking about how to take trophy pictures. And, you know... In those days, it was like you were sitting straddling the elk or the deer, and 
you didn't care, you know, like that's just what the pictures you saw from your parents. Yeah. And that was the first time I was like, oh, I get it. You're supposed to, you know, put the tongue back in the mouth or clean up the blood and all these other things and get fancy about it. Um, and that's kind of evolved to now where it's like you get a lot of hate even for just posing behind the animal. You know, and so I don't know. It's I still think it's a part of it, and it's it's never going to go away. People are always going to be angry about holding a head up and or holding an animal up and, and looking happy. Um, but I don't think you can really judge that until you've been in that position. So I don't – for me, it's – I will res- take the most respectful picture I can – and I'll try to clean it up and make it pretty, but I'm never gonna not take grip and grin mm-hmm. photos because that's to me it's still important. I don't know. I think that's where I draw the line. You know, I know a lot of people won't take grip and grin photos anymore. Yeah, I, I've been with folks that are like, oh no, won't do that. Won't take a picture of uh, me with with my animal. Um, to me, that's almost disrespectful. Yeah. Like I I want a picture. And I've got all sorts of pictures that came out terribly. Um, you know, I'm trying to put an old point and shoot camera on timer on my pack on a, you know, 30 degrees side, side slope. And, uh, you know, it doesn't turn out great, but I know exactly what happened in that moment. And it takes me back there like a lightning bolt like instantaneous like i know exactly what was happening in that point and how you know thankful i was that i actually accomplished something that day so um you know i i don't just quit judging people on on their trophy photos you don't, you don't know what's going on there does that work i don't know no i think we're yeah. on the same page i don't think i'm ever going to give it up i mean yeah i may be wrong but it's it's always going to be an evolution of that. Someone's going to be offended by everything. You know, yeah. There's always you can't you can't please everyone. What has been your biggest lesson learned? Uh, talk to me after this season. I'm sure I'll learn my biggest lesson after this season. <laughs> Every year. And then the next one after that. <laughs> yeah. Is there? Do you ever have reoccurring lessons? Oh, it, all the time. It's not like it's the biggest or this. It's like when something happens, you're like, you know, this is like the tenth time this has happened. You would think I would learn by now. Yeah, every time. You're like, well, I thought I could just move, but the elk all ran away again. Yeah. I'm going to learn that next time. Yeah, it happens all the time. I think my one of my biggest lessons, you know, a long time ago, that kind of shifted my mindset. I was on a hunt in Idaho, and, uh, I mean, there's big, big elk everywhere in Idaho, right? <laughs> yeah, behind every tree. So I'm 200-inch deer and 300-inch bulls behind every tree. And I was chasing this bull and just working ridge, he kind of had a herd, and I was following him forever, and uh, pouring down rain, I left my pack, I don't know, miles back, everything was just not going as planned, and it all fell through, the bull shut up and left, and I was left there soaking wet, my range finder was so wet it didn't work, I had to go find my pack and all this, and I was ready to give up, like I think it was day six or seven, I had one day left, and I didn't own a dry piece of gear, that's it, it was all wet. And I went back to camp, and I was like, I'm just going to hate myself if I leave. I'm, I'm going to hate myself. I, I said I was going to leave, but I'm like, I'm going to hate myself if I do it. So I literally drove to town, got some dry, dry pants and shirt, I think, or rain gear or something. Oh, I had to buy a new range finder because my range finder went out. And I came back that night, and in a blink of an eye, I went back to the same area, and it just got lucky. Like, the bull bugles run down there, and he just runs right out in front of me. And I shoot this big six point, and it all happened that fast. And I just remember thinking, like, it all can happen so fast. And I was ready to give up. I was ready to go home. I was wet. And so that was, like, the changing moment for me. It was like, now I can always look back on that and be like, remember that one time where you almost went home and you didn't and killed a big six point? So for me, that was kind of like a turning point. Just yeah, having that absolutely. ingrained in your head. Uh, How do you relax in the backcountry? There is no relax. I like that one, too. <laughs> Uh, I like that one. How do you relax in the back? I don't. It really? is no. Nope, it is. I am a stressed out. I am on pins and needles, and I love it. I love every second of it. To me, it's 100% always figuring, trying to figure out what to do, where to go. Like I want. It's not vacation. Period. It is not a vacation to me. Um, that I, is probably the only place I've ever taken a nap. Ah, true. It's true. Yep. 
Backcountry naps are pretty relaxing. Oh, yeah. But, Absolutely. I mean, you're burnt. I mean, you need it. Like, if you're going to go super hard and, you know, say you get done at dark and it's two hours back to camp and you're two hours before you, you know, before daylight, you're, you're getting roughly five hours of sleep a night and burning, I mean, 10 to 20 miles a day on foot. Yeah. That's how you relax. <laughs> Wear yourself completely out. And then fall asleep on the side of a mountain. Never turn your cell phone on. It's fantastic. Yeah. So what's your thoughts on, on technology in the backcountry? It was interesting. Uh, so one of the proposed rule changes here in the state of Idaho would uh, conceivably limit, you know, legally limit uh, pretty much all picture-taking technology, uh, the way I read the rule. So... That's if crazy. you take a, uh, it relates to trail cams, um, and again, this is my interpretation of of the uh, of the rule. Um, uh, trail cams. So if you use a trail cam, you can't hunt that day. If you if you take a picture of a of a animal through, um, uh, yeah, phone scope, something phone like scope, that. Yeah. yeah. Um, What's your thought on that? Uh, a, I don't think it would be enforceable. I think fishing game would be getting themselves in a in a bad situation. But uh, I I do not like technology in the backcountry. Like I've been on hunts where people are so plugged into uh, you know their uh, Iridium Go that I don't feel like they're actually locked into the hunt that we're on and I feel like that is is terribly wrong um, you know it's it's a way to remove yourself it's a very very easy way for people to be comfortable in the backcountry because they can separate themselves and be like oh I'm on Facebook even yeah. though I'm I hate that um, I, 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 so I am all for limiting technology in this particular instance um, so would you if you could would you get rid of cam or truck cameras? Where do you draw the line? So here's the the point that I love about trail cameras is I talk to all sorts of folks that the trail camera thing because they're getting these pictures of random animals and sometimes bizarre stuff it has become like this major family activity and it's year round. Mm -hmm. So it's not just dad going into the woods or your brother going into the woods to check t trail cameras like everybody wants to go in there and see what yeah. the pictures are and and I think that's phenomenal so as far as hunter recruitment goes I think you'd be crazy to do yeah, away with that um, I have been you know hunting in New Mexico and stuff where every trail or every uh, watering hole has like five trail cameras on it and I hate seeing stuff like that, but I'm not sure how you can have one without the other. What I, think are your if you, I think if you limited them, and this would be tough to do, but I think if, if they eliminated trail cams in the backcountry, I wouldn't even bat an eye. I wouldn't care. It wouldn't affect me. Like It'd be kind of cool. I, I do see your point. Like I If I had private land and I had deer on it, like it's cool to see the deer. Whether I hunt them or not, it's still cool to see deer yep. in game cam pictures and stuff like that. Um, I do think that we're inevitably going to hit uh, an issue because they, you just cameras keep getting you know more and more and more and more and more people live streaming them. live streaming yeah pretty soon you're gonna have live streaming elk cams yeah. i think they do oh geez. yes yeah well, i heard there's one that's like 360 around the tree too like so now you can see everything yeah so yeah i i don't know like it's eventually you will not have to leave your home what about so with that rule does that affect cell phones yeah, I believe. I mean, the way I read it, it it would be any sort of transmitting, uh, streamable. Really? Yeah, so, so you technically, it'd be your cell phone too. Yeah, yeah. I don't uh, think they can ban that though. Well, you know, there's always the caveat, and you know, I grew up in Montana, came from Montana, and and you cannot use two-way communication to, uh, you know, target game, talk about game location really talk about hunting at all mm -hmm. um so uh idaho you can use two-way communication currently um but just like in montana if they change this rule the caveat is 
if it's a safety issue, you can use the stuff, right? Um, I just, I never, never got into it myself. Don't own a trail camera. And I don't believe I've, uh, I probably have put one or two up, I guess, but. Um, so you anti-radios too? Yeah, I don't like it. I mean, but, it doesn't really matter to me. Yeah, yeah. The only downside is when you're like, that you got a hunting partner and you're like, where did he go or what's he doing? Like trying to figure it out. I mean, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. But it's there's convenience factors. There's convenience factor, and I I think there's a, a safety factor. Again, you feel more comfortable being able to, especially in a high stress situation, like you've wounded an animal or you know made a perfectly excellent shot on an animal, but you're not sure where it went. Mm-hmm. Man, there's it you you know you're a human being, a social animal. You feel better being able to reach out and talk to somebody. Yeah. Oh, for sure. So here's another one. This is going to be on the controversial thing. I posted something the other day that was about these um, knocks that are GPS. Oh, They're like, they're wow. like Bluetooth. So, you know, there's there was something that popped up. Um, I don't know. It was like a year ago I saw it. And it's like this fish hook that goes on your broadhead, and it sticks in the hide. And I'm super against that. I just think that would be used in the wrong way. The newest device now is like a Bluetooth tracker that goes in your knock, and it's a lighted knock. And you can use your phone with the Bluetooth to find your arrow. So, do you, are you again? Like, I could see how it's justifiable to some people. I'm not a huge fan of it. I just think it could be used in the wrong way, for the record. But I do see, like, okay, I'm shooting 3D behind the house. I lose an arrow by the target, and at least now I can use my phone to find it. Or, say, I shoot an elk and I pass through a shot, I can find the arrow to do it. What's your thought on that? Where's the line in technology with GPS tracking? Man, you know, uh, first outfitter I ever worked for, I just idolized the the guy, I still do. Um, he's got more knowledge than I will ever have, and I feel like even if I just pound it every day from here till the end of time, I will not have the same knowledge set, skill set that this man has. And a large part of that is because my brain doesn't have to work as hard because I have so much more technology at my fingertips. And, you know, you go back a generation, they didn't. And they had, they had to have, you know, acquire this boots on the ground training and knowledge. And, and I guarantee a lot of that came at the cost of some lost meat or, um, you know, possibly the cost of, you know, some lost human lives and search and rescue situations and things like that. But, you know, it... But what makes you a better hunter at the end of the day? Yeah, I think... I think that's a lot of it, too. I think it, uh, you got to go out there and figure it out. And there's so many things out there right now that are taking care of that for you. So I got a question for you. Someone asked a little bit ago about how long do you stick with a unit? So when you get a unit, I mean, it's hard because a lot of the guys that I talk to or a lot of people we interview on the podcast, they, you know, they hunt the same areas year in and year out. They've kind of narrowed it down. Yeah. But in those early years, you're kind of burning through units and you don't really know what's good and what's bad. How do you make the call on you? Like this unit's just no good anymore. Uh, I think there's a couple of ways to do it. I think you can start right now and just say, I'm going to hunt a new spot every Within your unit, I'm going to hunt a new spot every day. doesn't matter how good it was, how bad it was. I'm just going to learn this place, hunt a new spot every day. And I think that will set you up confidence-wise to be able to jump to the next unit and try something new. Uh, you know, honestly, a lot of this is checking out new country for me. So. And that's always it. I always, like, anytime I scout in there, I'm like, okay, here's where I think I'm going to go. And then here's two or three places that I want to check out this year that are new. And yeah. so, you know, maybe I blow a stock or blow some elk out of there, out of my old spot. I'm like, okay, let's go back and, and see, you know, like, let's look at this new spot or this new spot or that new spot. Yeah. But as far as a unit, do you ever just like, okay, this unit's not doing it anymore. i got to find a new unit. Man, I've, I am the worst person to talk to about this. I've been <laughs> like the you know general tag dude forever so 
it was all about trying out new spots. So for me, it was like, I mean, I've had, I've had to switch units a few times, and mainly it's because, you know, I just get too many people for my liking. I don't like to hunt with people. Like, if there's a lot of people in a unit, I'm just kind of over it. Um, I don't like the pressure. I mean, if I can try to get to somewhere that's backcountry and not see anybody, that's the ideal situation. Um, and so for me, it was just the number of people. I mean, I think the elk numbers were the same. Um, both times I've ever decided that, okay, I'm just not going to that unit anymore. I think it was just the, the people numbers got too high for me. Mm-hmm. That made the experience different. It was combat hunting. Yeah, and that is, you know, everything hits, you know, it's all fads, right? There's popularity, it ebbs and flows. And um, sometimes if, if you gut it out, all the people leave. Um, and, but, yeah, you're going to have to see a lot more trucks at your favorite uh, trailheads. Uh, for a while to watch that thing finally shift and turn, but so it will. It, so as an anti-tech guy, do you run a GPS or are you just all old school map? Uh, both. You still run, you do run a GPS and you run an old school map? Uh, the GPS really stays in my backpack. Um, you know, I've definitely been in a lot of stupid spots where I <laughs> at least try to mark camp once I set camp. Um, but uh, I get in this like super paranoia phase where I'm like, oh, the GPS is going to run out of batteries, so I can't ever use it until I absolutely need it. So I'm a, I, well, I'm terrible. I would never turn my GPS on. I'm old school maps. Yeah. Um, I will, I did, in the last couple of years, I've gotten a lot better at using the GPS to mm, kind of journal everything. Like where I'm like, say take elk hunting for example, I'll be like, okay, bugle here, bugle here, bugle here. Um, but I'll also do that on a map. I always have a map that's laminated so I can, you know, yep. wet, dry, draw on it, whatever. Uh, but to me, like, I, I don't know if it's just old school, but I always have to have a map. And like, it helps me see big pictures. So like GPS, the biggest problem I have is that the screen is so small that it's like, you can't see big picture scenarios. Right. So I'm like, okay, where these elk went? And you're like trying to scroll across the GPS, like where'd they go? They go here, do they go there? Whereas if I have a map, it's like, okay, if I was an elk and I'm gonna come over this saddle where I bumped them, where are they gonna go? They're gonna go probably this patch right here. Yes. So that's kind of what I like. Also, if I could have the perfect map would be like a map on one side and a Google Earth printout on the other, laminated together. That's like my go-to. Yeah, I like that. Cause then Google Earth, I know what the, what the, timber patches look like yeah that is the and you know like last year we scrutinized this area on google maps uh or google earth and we're like oh yeah that's going to be just perfect for this and we actually hiked in there and it was not yeah like it was completely the opposite terrain of what we thought it was going to be um but still very helpful um what uh what do you got going on big this year what's like it's still the thing, of, you know? The thing. Well, I would say it's tough because it's still mapping out everything out. Um, I did draw a pretty good mule deer tag in Oregon, and so, you know, I am not a mule deer hunter <laughs> at all. So it's uh, that's my learning curve. And I kind of want to put some effort into that just because I've never really killed a good mule deer. Might as well try. It's a good tag. It is a rifle tag, though, um, but I still think I'm going to put a lot of effort into that. But other than that, you know, I'm gonna spend uh, a couple weeks, you know, horseback into the into the Bob, into the nice. in Montana. So that's that's always my go-to hunt. Um, that's kind of like my escapism. That's my adventure. That's all that stuff. What uh, trailhead do you use, and how far do you go in? Oh, exact numbers are oh, it's it's buffering. <laughs> uh, gang, we're gonna wrap this up. I know we have a ton of awesome questions, uh, but you know, it's getting late here. Uh, we have a really cool uh, kind of uh, collab with Exo Packs. Uh, we got our new cipher pattern on the 3500 pack, um, only available through tomorrow. Ooh. Exo Mountain Gear. So um, killer packs and uh, limited release. So you may want to check that out. Um, thank you very much, Cody Rich. Thanks, guys. Rich Outdoors Podcast. Uh, I told you we get cool folks that swing through the office on occasion. So. <laughs> All the time.
So we're going to give away some stuff. Are we going to do it on this? Are we going to do it in the comments, or how do we do it? I think we're going to follow up on comments because we've had a lot of really good comments. Does that work for you? That's fine. Awesome. I don't know who's going to judge this, but someone's going to get selected to win, I guess, this hat and some new First Light gear. So. Yes. All right. Thanks so much for coming out, and uh, we will see you again. And uh, we'll both try to uh, hammer out a bunch of these questions tomorrow. So also, uh, we're gonna, check back in. If you guys, I mean, I guess if you want to hear this again or follow up, um, we're going to post this on the podcast probably next week. So if you guys didn't catch everything, want to hear it again, or send it to someone else, we're going to post it up on the Rich Outdoors podcast. All right. Thanks so much. Peace, guys. Have